Pass is back. But uh, in my fast, I'm a teacher. He gave the background sound up need to. Here is what might be, this is linked to sound, I assume? Sure. So this is a, this is what may be, oh, how do I get the internet in here? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's all secured. There's no internet for me. No internet for Jeff. You can put it on my lap. It, do you, you can send me your presentation. So I'll describe it, and we'll watch it afterwards as the technology is solved. So what this says, Historic Legislative Act, was, uh, I, or, which is going to be a great opening, was uh, organized a, uh, uh, people familiar with Rick Rolling? Mm -hmm. So Rick Rolling, who's familiar with Rick Rolling? Please describe the class. Uh, describe the what? R describe Rick Rolling to the class. So it's uh, when you, you send somebody a link and you say, hey, check out my new dog or whatever, and it's actually a link to YouTube where you get to see uh, Rick Astley sing uh, Never Let You. Never Gonna Give You Up, Never Gonna Let You Down. Rick Astley's a moral number one hit. And the and so what I was able to do in my uh, first session legislature was organize 13 legislators to include lines from Rick Astley's immortal song into their floor speeches and then weave them together at the end. That now is 1.6 million views on YouTube. We have the whole song. And, and it's the most attention I received for anything I did in the legislature, <laughs> uh, which demonstrates the, the law of legislative ther thermodynamics, which is the attention item receives in the legislature is almost exactly inversely proportional to is proportionate to its importance. What I wanted to do today was feed back to you what I heard. Uh, because as I went around last night, uh, what I realized confirmed a hunch, which is that the answers to whatever questions you have are already probably in this room. And that the novelty of an outside speaker outside your industry either ensures that you will receive almost nothing relevant, or that it could provide an interesting synthesis coming from the side of things that you already know. So what I did last night, I didn't get around to everybody, but I got around actually to more than half of you, and just asked, what's your advice to the crew? And then spent the night last night after I got home and some of the day today putting together a no images, all words, breaking the law of PowerPoint, uh, presentation synthesizing some of what I think I learned and these are lessons you can disregard because I'm outside your industry and what the hell do I know or they might be useful if only to synthesize an argument you are having within yourselves with your organization that might have already been won but may not have been fully embraced so I heard some general stuff stay positive have faith continue to challenge Put things in perspective. Carol Ann said, feed the right wolf. Do people know what that means? The movie Tomorrowland, there's two wolves fighting, the wolf of, wolf of joy from the wolf of despair. Which one survives? The one you feed, so feed the right wolf. Continue to be bold. There was some sales specific stuff. <laughs> 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 with advanced services in every hardware sale, said Terry, because Angela needs a new pair of shoes. Amen. That's what Chris said. That was funny. So I Googled it. It was my homework in the evening. Right. Uh, and, and I was thinking about some of the, I was thinking about this one, not this one. I was thinking about this one. Package H. Tom solutions with advanced services at every hardware sale. I believe this is what? High touch, is that outreach? Operations manager. Operations manager. Not, I, I wrote down managed and they corrected me and said it was manager, the human being. So, and, and it made me think about the question. What was interesting to me about doing this and, and spending some time thinking about it is, relating the exercise of sales teams and the, the performance of sales teams to where we are in history. And, uh, and a question, a book I'll refer, uh, Daniel Pink, anybody a Daniel Pink fan? He re uh, wrote Drive, wrote uh, A Whole New Mind, and wrote uh, To Sell as Human. Read all three or read like an executive summary, all three worth your time. Uh, Daniel Pink opens To Sell as Human with sort of the question, in the internet era, is a sales team less relevant? Uh, car dealers, I don't need one. Jewelers, I don't really need one. A travel agent, I definitely don't need one of those. 
But he argues that more people use sales and persuasion in their jobs, perhaps at any time in human history. But that sales has changed. You already know some of this. I'll move on to some of your quotes. Tony offered, a bunch of people let me know, and nobody was doing it in a bragging way, but let me know that you had a really good quarter, a really good half year. And, and Tony said, we have to figure out how do we have success after success. I thought about this a little bit. I thought about basketball championships. Basketball fans? Anybody? Yeah. Right. So I used to coach basketball. And the, uh, I, I was a lousy player. I, I'm a good basketball player for a 40-year-old. Uh, but I, I was a lousy player, but a decent basketball coach for very small children. And I read a bunch of basketball stuff. Uh, Pat Riley had his disease of me and then his sequel, the disease of more. The disease of me was the thing that had to be overcome during when a team was moving towards its first championship. The disease of more is what you have to overcome after you've won one. It's like, ah, maybe my bonus should be bigger. Maybe our car should, my car should be nicer. Why is that person getting more than me? I was just as important to that championship team as anyone else. We lose discipline and we take our eye off the process that got us successful in the first place which wasn't always looking merely at outcome and waiting for a quarterly return, but figuring out how to solve problems along the way. Uh, the other thing that occurred to me after listening to Tony was uh, only mildly related to my own story. The firm I went to after law school is a very fancy law firm. And, uh, and one, of their, one of their partners had moved into my law school to become a professor. This is sort of a rare thing, because he did it within like three months after becoming partner. And I don't, I don't know the stair steps in your company uh, as well as you do, but imagine sort of the big brass ring that you're reaching for through your career, and the moment you get it, you bail. Not to another company for better compensation, but to teach at a law school. And when asked why, he, he said, well, making partner at Wachtel Lipton is a little like winning a pie eating contest, except for the prize is more pie. And the, uh, and he didn't have, he wasn't deeply committed to the mission of the organization. He was committed to the mission of the law school. And to me, when I watch organizations that, that find success after success, uh, find success after success, it's because the win wasn't the thing that they were focused on anyhow. It was solving the problem that they were interested in anyhow. Uh, the San Antonio Spurs, uh, I'll use Bobby Knight instead. Uh, Bobby Knight said that the reason that he kept coaching was he was waiting for the perfect basketball game. Right? And so he kept coaching. He, 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 would, he would, after he got discredited in Indiana, he kept coaching at lesser schools because he left coaching. He loved coaching, but because he was looking for the perfect game. I, ran, I started an organization called The Bus Project. We got young people involved in politics. We faced this when we were working on the Oregon legislature and we succeeded at that in, in what we wanted to do and, and in turning your legislature. And for us, what it was was innovation. The answer to us, the answer for us to have success after success was to figure out the next thing we needed to do. Maybe you guys already figured that out. It doesn't add that much value, but those are my three thoughts. So the first is avoid the disease of more. Second, get ready to eat. Uh, more pie. The third, uh, think about innovation around your value proposition, around what motivates you beyond Angela's new pair of shoes, which I'm totally in favor of. I'm totally in favor. I want her lots of shoes. I would like some for myself. She actually said, "Mama, she might want shoes for her mother." I don't. I might. I might have had that wrong. All right. Heard this one a lot. Uh, Nathan is new, and he's not here now, but he's only been with you, I think, three days? It was either three days or a month and a half. Two three, three, days. three days. Three days. And, and, I was at, and I had a nice conversation about why he joined. And he said, well, because here, if I figure out a problem that needs to be solved for a client, I know that there's somebody here who can solve it. Because we have so many tools. We're, and we're, we're best of breed in a bunch of those tools. But just normally, the uh, loss of focus could be criticized. But here we have an armada of services that can be offered. And there's, and there's nobody. There's nobody in those other companies as a teammate like that. Roberta was a little more prescriptive. She, <laughs> she talked at some length 
uh, about don't just throw things over the fence the services make sure you understand what everybody on the team is doing I like Ethan's story Ethan also three days right yep so Ethan three days and explained hey it, it laid out a story and he said when we screwed up uh, there were people who were ready to back the sales team and fix it that quote is exactly right because I've never say the F word. <laughs> <laughs> not on company time. And I apologize it's not a company computer. But absolutely said it. <laughs> <laughs> a salesman in line. Um, the, and I was trying to think of a, of a story or lesson that's a little more personal related to this about leveraging, about leveraging strengths. So two years ago, I agreed to help a couple friends who wanted to start a radio station. And I didn't know what I was getting into when I said, yes, I'd help. Uh, before too long, I was running a radio station and it had swallowed up my life. And, uh, but I was enjoying it and feeling I was making something that was worth doing, trying to build an iconic organization that will live past me. And it's very small. Uh, and, the, and one of the challenges we had, and that we still have, is we're, we have an eclectic format. Uh, radio, throughout the 20th century, figured out that the way to be successful is pick a format, be country, be rock and roll, be, uh, be hot AC, which I didn't know what it was until I started doing this, which means hot adult contemporary. It kind of sounds like a Spice Channel, but all it means is like, <laughs> and the, uh, because that's how people listen. They pick their format. That's why OPB dumped any music from their, dumped all the music shows from their channel because they wanted to make sure that when listeners went there, they knew they'd get talked. We have 120 DJs and show hosts. We have people who are experts in their genre from Indian uh, Bollywood music to, uh, to death metal. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a show called Kick-Ass Oregon History and we're working on a show about comic books. And that creates a weakness for us in predictability, which normally is doom in the radio market. But we figured out, and at least our bet, and so far our bet hasn't failed, is that in the internet era, that could be a strength. Because we could, sort of like the long, the Amazon's long tail, we could seize all the fans of the genre within our small niche. And even if that was confusing to a listener who was trying to listen 24 hours a day, that's not what we were looking for, but we could convene those people. But here was sort of the teamwork piece. We found another way that this weakness could be a strength, not just the internet, was we talked to a hotel who wanted to curate music. So the problem we have is we just turn on a radio station, they're always gonna play the same kind of music, that's not gonna work for us. And now we're realizing if we go to Bishop's Barbershop or go to High Low Hotel, and, and we're trying to find about a third of our revenue that will be enterprise revenue, not just asking people like you for money, not just membership, nonprofit revenue grants, but enterprise revenue, that we can do that by working with organizations saying, whatever it is that your customer needs, whatever taste your customer has, I can almost guarantee you we have a music curator within our stable who is tied for the best there is in that genre. And, it tur and so we have sort of a small armada. <laughs> And I think that that, my guess is that success here will be leveraged uh, more deeply as you figure out how to leverage success of people other than you. I liked your story, I wrote down your name, and I get it, it uh, nope, Asana? Yeah, All right, and I, may have, and I may have misspelled it, but you have to remind me the company you were talking about. You have to you're talking about, the, or the tool, the tool that did the, the heat maps. Oh, CMX. CMX. I, I, thought, I, thought it had, I thought it had a name that started with an M. Meraki. Meraki, all right. So the, so I wanna, I wanna use that story in a moment, but then here's the punchline. Here was the big one, here's the most powerful thread I've ever this is, the, this is why I find it fascinating. It related to evolution of sales. A bunch of people said these exact words. We gotta do something not just be a commodity. We gotta not just, Sling servers out of the back of a van. <laughs> Want to buy a server? Oh, geez, that was supposed to be a Coke. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth put it most sharply. Uh, Diana put the focus on the customer. Oxenet, did I spell it right? You know what? You know what? All right, I'll get off this slide soon. 
but I was respectful enough. This means, did I misspell it? That's what that means. Uh, does everybody know this story? Um, I'm, I'm sure they know about Meraki, but um, how to use it. Let's tell the story. Okay. Um, if I remember, it was after a couple of drinks. So. <laughs> <laughs> you were very energetic, and I really enjoyed it. You know, actually, um, I told one of my customers, they said, after you drink, you show your true self. So I told one of my customers that when I drink, I talk a lot. And he said, more? <laughs> so, so yes, I do. Okay, so this was about how um, CMX software that comes with Meraki, you guys know, can show you where customers are within the store. And you can utilize that for customers that already have Meraki to say, hey, you know, you can make your associates more um, uh, efficient, and I can show you how to send uh, the associates to where people are. Um, and and for that matter, if you know where they spend time, maybe you want to put a cash register there. So there's a lot of value that comes out of um, investments that um, they've already made with uh, Cisco, but they're not necessarily leveraging it for all the use cases. I think is that the one you were talking yeah. about? Yeah, okay. uh, it, it was sort of your ver your version of the post-it note, the uh, the ancillary benefit of the product. I guess not through error, uh, but through thinking about how to solve a problem based on technology that you have. But I love what Nathan said. Not just talking to the customer in their language, and not just, even if it's not what you're compensated on, but make their life better. Daniel Pink argues that in the internet age, it's harder to manipulate people because they have the information. Just knowing the sales price isn't good enough. Greenleaf says that those who move others, if what is needed now is to move others, not only manipulate them, is therefore to serve. Serve first and sell later. Nathan's comment, make their life better. The test is if <coughs> the person agrees to buy, will their life be better? If the interaction is over, will the world be better? My dad's a weird cat. I do a radio show with my dad. It's called News with My Dad. It's called that because I talk about the news with my dad. And we had to it very much. And he's, I mean, this is a guy who named me, I'll tell just a couple stories. Uh, he, this is a guy who named me Jefferson, named my older brother Lincoln. And when, uh, and not just long ago, we were supposed to do a meeting. And I said, uh, I said, we got to do this meeting. He said, I can't go, I'm going on a date with my wife. And I said, oh, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to Cirque, Cirque du Soleil and then a romantic dinner. And he said, and I said, oh, great, where are you going to go to dinner? He said, I don't know, we have a coupon. And I just, like that was, that's my dad. When uh, he did, for a long time, he taught seminars for a company that's now called Franklin Covey. It's a company that was started by my uncle. It was started out as Heim Smith and Associates, then became Franklin Institute, then Franklin Quest, then became uh, Peckford Covey, but they bought the Covey organization. And I love the story of how Franklin started. How they got started is they would teach seminars. And he would teach a seminar, but he wouldn't charge anything. It'd be a day long. And the only way they would get paid is if people bought the day plan. They want to charge a hundred bucks for it. And they'd fill a pretty big room. They'd already paid for the rent. And he would do the seminar. And at the end of it, every single person. They had a rare time when they'd have one person not buy. They had a hundred percent purchasing at the end of these seminars. Meanwhile, their leading competitor, Dave Timer, was selling their day planners and grocery stores and stationery stores. And they said, no, we won't do that. And the weird thing is, is they wouldn't allow a mechanism at that point in the company to just buy a day planner. He said, because our purpose is not selling day planners. Yeah, that's the way we figured out how to make money, but our purpose has changed people's lives. And so they never allowed their day planner just sold in stationery stores until they could make their own stationery store, their own Franklin store, to hopefully immerse people in their experience. And that they focused on that value proposition, and they focused on their real purpose, which was not just the not just their quarterly return, but was solving the problem of their customer, including problems their customers didn't know they had. And after a success, they didn't have to take too long of a break because their mission wasn't fulfilled. Their mission was to change the world and make people more effective. And there was always more of that to do, even after they had a good quarter. And I find 
these lessons of what is what are, what are sales teams, and and when I say that, I don't just mean to say I, I, I have done some sleuthing and asking and understand a little bit about your sales teams. I understand the salesperson is with the engineers is with the services. I call it the sales team, although I may be maybe misnomer. Do you guys call it sales units? You call it something else unit? Whatever. Performance unit, <laughs> whatever you want. The uh, and, I, and I'm fascinated about the application of the sales team in the information age. Because the purpose and primary result of information age has been to reduce transaction costs, to make transactions cheap. Therefore, the salesperson who dwells merely in transactions is also cheap. I want to talk about economic nerdiness. People know Ronald Coates, I'm sure we, we have probably at least a couple economics majors here. Ronald Coates, developer of the Coase Theorem, won the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, came across my radar screen again because he also changed the FCC rules or designed the model for how radio stations are bought and sold. It had nothing really to do with the Coase theorem. He popularized the idea of transactions cost, the cost of making an economic exchange. They break down into three parts. This is the economics nerd portion. Really, just before five o'clock, we have to have, yes, because we're going to give you some information more than just some stories. So they have three costs, three types, search information costs, kind of obvious bargaining costs, policing and enforcement costs. Typical example, the used car buyer. The search costs are finding the car and determining the car's condition. The bargaining costs are negotiating the price. The policing costs are ensuring the seller delivers the car in the condition that was expected. But the internet, <laughs> find the price, I click buy, pick up the car. Internet age, manipulating the purchaser is harder because they have more information. If we're selling servers at the back of a van, <laughs> we're only successful until somebody comes along with a nicer van and a cheaper server. <laughs> if what we do is have a commodity, someone can beat us. If what we are is a grocery store, we add little value. importantly because then you're not very important because I can find out the price of a server in my phone in 90 seconds I'm gonna have it shaken and the irony the other reason I was motivated to do this the irony of this is it's partly your own fault because not only here but in other places where you've worked you've been trying to make information more accessible <laughs> and your success in making the internet effective and in shrinking, in shrinking transaction costs, your success is requiring you to change your job. Puzzles versus mysteries. Mystery is where you don't know. I, I, I got this from, uh, from Malcolm Gladwell. He didn't invent it. He just popularized it. That's his move. My move is to steal his stuff and give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, a mystery is where we don't know the answer because we don't have the information. A puzzle is we don't have the answer despite the availability of the information, but because we can't make sense of the information. So finding Osama bin Laden was a mystery to figure out where he was. Enron, everything they did was subject to public filings. Ultimately, they were caught not because of somebody like Deep Throat, but because an accountant was willing to go through the public filings and actually figure out what they were doing. It wasn't a mystery. Somebody was willing to solve the puzzle. In an information era, there are fewer mysteries, but there are many, many, many more puzzles. I don't know. That was my best one. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just thought. <laughs> Bigger, sorry, but it says here when we have access to the same information, selling comes based on your ability to move others. One of the most effective ways of moving others is to uncover challenges they might not know that they have. I had a conversation last night about, you know, I understand it'd be cool if you know Mac can make some thirty million dollar deal. We got to make some two hundred fifty thousand dollar deals. I did some quick, quick arithmetic. You know how many $250,000 deals it takes to make one $330 million deal? It's 120, right? You do worse if you make 119 of them. 119 is a lot. Now, some of those 119 might be the equivalent of loss leaders, 
might be something that you know generates a larger deal down the road. This doesn't mean a two hundred fifty thousand dollar deal isn't worth doing. It's totally worth doing. But it's still managing 119, 120, 121 relationships. It's solving 120 problems. Maybe better because down the road, but not necessarily easier, not necessarily more highly leveraged. Help people uncover challenges they might not know they have. Just about done. <coughs> uh, we live in an era of money and robots, it's my phrase. If you look at the greatest fortunes that have been made over the last 40 years, they've been made essentially at Wall Street and Silicon Valley, Valley, not necessarily geographically described. I'm on the side of humanity and purpose. I think people are supposed to be in charge. I think people are supposed to be in charge of money. I think people are supposed to be in charge of the robots. For humanity to win, our challenge is to master the robot. You can help us master the robot. Your purpose is not to have a good quarter. You're not the transaction. It's your best to have a world improvement. You can help us master the robot. You can help us make the world better. If we do that, we can have success after success. If we do that, it's worth going to work the next day, even after you had a good quarter. I really appreciate you guys.